I'd like to introduce today's presenters whose work is featured in a current exhibit at the U.S. Botanic Garden called Cultivate, Growing Food in a Changing World. Shannon Martin is an enrolled, enrolled citizen of the Matabinashiwish Band of Potawatomi Indians, Gun Lake Tribe, and descendant of the Lakutare Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Shannon is the executive director and founder of Cultural Pathways Group, LLC, which supports the development of culture, cultural activation and preservation initiatives, community-centered organizing, exhibition research development, NAGPRA, or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, repatriation e efficacy, and strategic planning for indigenous and non-indigenous communities and institutions. Shannon is the former director of the Zibi Wing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways, Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan, dedicating over 19 years to the award-winning cultural center and tribal museum. Rosebud Bear Schneider is an enrolled citizen of the Lakutare Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians and a recognized descendant of the Lac du Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewas. Rosebud is a farmer, producer, and community organizer. Her involvement with Indigenous food sovereignty work spans over the last 15 years. First as a breastfeeding educator and maternal infant home visitor with Healthy Start and WIC, and then as a farmer and nutrition educator with the Sacred Roots Food Sovereignty Project in Detroit. Her time with Sacred Roots illuminated the passion Rosebud has to feed and care for her community. She also expanded her roots throughout the Detroit Agriculture Network as a farmer and former board member at Keep Growing Detroit. As a farmer and producer, she continues to provide traditional foods across Turtle Island. Rosebud remains dedicated to supporting community health and wellness by educating on the importance of revitalizing indigenous foodways. Her lifelong goal is to give her children and the coming generations the knowledge and skills to live a well-rounded, healthy life woven with ancestral ways. David Mishner is a curator at the University of Michigan Mathai Botanical Gardens and Nichols Arboretum and a member of the university's mentor faculty in the Public Engagement Faculty Fellowship. With tribal partners across Michigan, he has been working on restoring relationships among the institutions of the state's 12 indigenous nations with their relatives and cultural heritage that is in university stewardship, including across major properties stewarded by the botanical gardens. This includes seed rematriation work. David is more widely known for his work with historic peonies and living collection management. He is on the board of directors of the American Peony Society and co-authored a book with Carol Adelman, Peonies, The Best Varieties for Your Summer Garden, which was featured in the New York Times Best Summer Reading List the summer after it was published. Over to you, Shannon, Rosebud, and David. Middle Village, Middleville, Michigan, and Donjaba, Shaganashi, Moen, Majima. Welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Miigwech to uh, the U.S. Botanic Garden for hosting us today. Rosebud? Miigwech, Shannon. Um, Anibuju Bamasa Nokwe Indigenous Kaz Mankwadodem Wawiatanang in Donjaba. Welcome everybody. My name is Rosebud Bear Schneider. Um, I'm, I'm from originally from Detroit. Um, <clears throat> Wawiatanang is the word that we use for Detroit. Um, I'm Bear Clan. I'm Anishinaabe, and um, honored to be here today. Miigwech. On to you, David. Welcome everyone. <clears throat> I'm David Michener. I'm ninth generation Euro-American uh, settler, and I've been living in Michigan for the last 32 years. Many people expect a land acknowledgement at the beginning. And it's important not only to acknowledge the ancestral and continuing perpetual homelands we're on, but to, to recognize the commitments that come from it, commitments that have often been broken. In 1817, the tribes of Lower Michigan 
signed a coercive treaty at the foot of the rapids. As part of that coercive treaty, an institution was to be set up, quote, a college at Detroit, and commitments were made about that. This university, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, is that college at Detroit. It has not historically lived up to its commitments. That is the reality we have today. One of the ways of moving forward is out of a Micmac concept of two-eyed seeing, where we bring together indigenous and Western ways of knowing. And it's important to acknowledge that these are ways of knowing, not some sort of existential Western truth, but they are knowledge systems that are based in our cultures and lead us to the future. Here at the Botanical Gardens, working with tribal colleagues who represent their sovereign nations, we have several areas where we're exploring how to do we restore right relationships between the peoples of these places and their kin, kin including lands, waters, rocks, trees, plants, in ways that we can acknowledge that we are actually not the owners and probably in the long term, not actually the stewards. And so we have here three of the uh, projects that shouldn't call them projects, three of the ways forward we're exploring. The first is seed rematriation, and we'll have more to say about that shortly. Because seed are living, seed are kin. And to be very clear, the seed that are under discussion in the long term are not here at the University Botanical Gardens. They are in the University Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, which is a separate part of the university. But kinships cross institutional boundaries that are imposed by the Western Academy. And it's important to have the larger picture that two-eyed seeing presents. The last element that I want to talk about in the introduction is why do museums even have tribal seeds? Why would the University of Michigan have what we believe is the third largest indigenous seed collection in North America in Turtle Island? The only ones we are aware of larger are the combined ones of the United States Department of Agriculture plus the Smithsonian and Agriculture Canada. To our knowledge, there is no good indexing of the, the seed, the relatives that are kept in museums such as at the University of Michigan at a regional or continental scale. Each one is different and each one is rooted in a culture of early 20th century um, science at the time, which viewed humanity through a often eugenics view of races and quite bluntly, from my perspective, I'm not trained as an anthropologist, seem to view the indigenous peoples of North America as if not a subordinate group of people, then one that was going to vanish forever. And so the museum seemed to have an interest in acquiring by one means or another, the cultural heritage and, and elements listed as objects in museums and that in short, is how I understand this to have come. Shannon, would you like to carry forward? So as David mentioned it in the previous slide, you could see the dissection of, of our sacred mounds, burial sites. Uh, while this pillaging was taking place, uh, at the same time, there was also uh, what we call a, a movement called salvage archaeology or salvage anthropology. And, and that was going at the, at the same time when our sacred sites and burial grounds were being uh, uh, excavated and oftentimes by treasure hunters pillaged as well. Um, so NAGPRA came into play, uh, the Native American Graves Rep uh, Protection and Repatriation Act in 1990 by an act of Congress. And that triggered universities, museums, and institutions who receive federal funding 
to consult with federally recognized tribal nations uh, on the collections and inventories held within their repositories. Uh, primarily, uh, well over 300,000 sets, a minimum number of ancestral human remains uh, were in various institutions and museums across the country. So during the time of the salvage archaeology anthropology, anthropology um, movement across this country, uh, botanical um, materials, botanical uh, and medicinal um, belongings were also confiscated and taken. And for many of us here in, in the Great Lakes, we call ourselves the Anishinaabe. Uh, we have a, a connection and we're taught about this sacred connection for our place and creation since we are at the time that we are able to recognize our place in creation. So we hear these uh, beautiful teachings and stories as young as two and three years old. Um, and in these connections, we understand that everything has a spirit. Our, our language, Anishinaabe Moen, is 85% is animated, action words. And it's that way because we do believe um, things have a spirit. Uh, we don't consider them deities or gods. Um, we understand there's only one creator, but like us, they have their own beautiful spirit that uh, protects them, provides them knowledge, and carries them through their lifetime. So that includes plants, trees, animals, fish, insects, rocks. Uh, and in our modern day world, uh, even our cars have a spirit. And so in that way, we, we have the reciprocal relationship and respect to care for for what, what is within our sphere of creation. So during a consultation with the University of Michigan, um, various tribes from Michigan were invited uh, to the university to sit down for sometimes two to three days uh, with the NAGPRA team. And that includes Dr. Ben Segunda, who you can see standing on the uh, left side of the picture. Uh, Amadeus Scott, our primary, our primary contacts at the university. And during a consultation, my mother, who was serving at that time as the NAGPRA representative for the Machi Benishwish Band of Potawatomi Indians, she seated in the white dress in the front. Uh, during a consultation in 2015, she, she asked the most simple but beautiful and profound question of the university officials. She asked, do you have seeds within your collections? And... Uh, they notated her question and said, Sydney, we'll, we'll get back with you. And uh, they truly did. Within a day after we left Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Amadeus phoned my mother and said, yes, we have an extensive ethnobotanical collection. And that triggered uh, what you're seeing here is our first meeting in August of 2016. Just less than a year later, the university was responsive to our request to begin exploring their ethnobotanic and seed collections, our relatives, seeds that were collected through these decades of, of uh, uh, salvage archaeology and anthropology and were held within the collections. And just like the repatriation of our ancestors and their funerary and sacred belongings, uh, many of us here in this picture believe that we also needed to free our seed relatives as well. And that triggered uh, the movement at the University of Michigan with the various tribes uh, now throughout the Great Lakes. This is a photo, a series of photos of the uh, ethnobotanical collection storage facility. And this is a brand new facility. Uh, and, and through the work of the various tribes consulting with the University of Michigan under NACPRA, uh, the university began to listen, truly listen. Uh, and in that listening, understood that the collections that 
were held in, in the Museum of Anthropological Anthropology, the original building were not adequate uh, for, for these precious belongings. And they moved uh, all of these precious uh, belongings to another facility. Many of the tribes assisted in moving our ancestors and their funerary belongings, uh, but they are in the, now housed in the same uh, environmentally regulated, top-notch, state-of-the-art facility now uh, as, our, as our seeds. So the seeds and the ancestors are together under the same roof. And this is a picture of one of the first meetings we were able to visit with our seed relatives. Uh, my mother in the, in the center photo is examining um, corn seeds that, that came from our territory here in, in the Gun Lake uh, Potawatomi um, area. And I believe that, uh, David, correct me if I'm wrong, is near Hamilton, Michigan. Dunningville is where those those beautiful corn seeds have come from, and attached to you know the metadata of those seeds uh, was a name she recognized uh, as a a friend of her her mother who was a um, uh, elder at the time. Shannon, may I make a few comments here? Absolutely. It's really important, it's foundational that the way forward begins here in Michigan on Turtle Island, even though the number of seeds, the living relatives are few out of the 4,000. Most are from other parts of Turtle Island, but if we don't begin here at the heart, at the core, at the center, how is there any legitimacy to go forward? And so some of the questions that I get asked at times, well, why not start with the tribes that are most represented or why not start given any other way? This university was founded in a quote, gift treaty extortion with the tribes. The seeds are here. The only way for integrity is to move forward with the tribes and the seeds that are here to set the way and as we have a way to move forward, then we can be involved with others whose relatives are, are quote, stewarded here. The waters unite the people. Most of us learn, quote, American and Canadian geography with the waters divide the people. There's an international boundary. I don't think the seeds can see it either. Um, and so Michigan and Ontario and how the tribal communities, the sovereign nations view who is related is what determines who is first, not how the seeds are indexed in the metadata. And it's important to note that the university, and we'll come to this later, in key ways makes no claim to own the seeds. We are stewards there is a difference. As part of the way forward was how do we plan? Because Western ways of planning come out of our epistemology of how to make knowledge and indigenous Anishinaabeg ways of, of planning are different. And so the only way forward is to meet and discuss how we will do this together. And Shannon helped lead that discussion for the better part of at least a half day or more in a meeting just amongst the key participants. Miigwech again, Shannon. Tribes are sovereign. I want that to sink in. Tribes are sovereign. If we want to go and look at, say, seeds that at some level, say, belong to the government of Japan, would we just haul any Japanese student in and ask permission to do it? No, we would work through the embassies and the State Department. We would have an agreement to frame the work. Over the course of a number of years working with MACRA, which represents the 12 tribes of Michigan, 
the regents of the University of Michigan and MACRA, the Michigan Anishinaabe Cultural and Preservation and, and Re Repatriation Alliance came to an, an agreement, a legally binding document, which have only excised the university side of the signatures. There's a whole series on the left. It is a short document framing the way forward and the protocols and that the way forward is fundamentally determined by the community of origin. And I bolded in here on the first bullet that these belong to the originating communities, not the University of Michigan. That is a signed legal statement of the university. It cannot be abrogated by anyone below, from the president down to any university curator or staff member. It is the interpretation of the law. That's an important framework, and it is part of how we are working to share power and to have cogenerative ways forward. Shannon, I can continue, or you can, either way. Yeah, David, I'll just, I'll provide an overview of this wonderful uh, vision that has now come to fruition, the Indigenous Collaborative Garden. And from a previous slide, you saw the planning. Uh, we engaged in consensus-based planning uh, with not only tribal representatives from throughout the, straight, the state and Canada, uh, but also with university officials. And in that way, we put our minds and hearts together to come up with a plan uh, to work together, to grow together, uh, and to, to enjoy the, the fruits of our labor together. And one of these ideas came to begin an indigenous collaborative garden at the Matai uh, Botanical Gardens in Nichols Arboretum. And David has been our champion uh, since the first meeting uh, at when we visited the seeds uh, in the storage facility. And he is also our junior ninny. And, and in our language, that means our money man. Uh, he has taken upon himself to continue this movement in the best way possible by leveraging uh, funds through university pockets of grants uh, and gifts to bring all of us together to continue this beautiful work. Uh, the planning is, it always takes place. Uh, visiting the seeds uh, is a part of our foundation and now growing and sharing seeds. So many tribal representatives have traveled to Ann Arbor to work with university faculty and students uh, on this garden where they grow things together uh, from their communities and then celebrate in the fall with a harvest feast. And all of this has generally been uh, subsidized generously by University of Michigan funding uh, through various uh, proposals and grants that David has found and hosted at the Botanical Gardens. Miigwech, Shannon. The key point that has been made repeatedly is following tribal protocols as interpreted by the elders is an indication that one has heard and one is showing respect. That means when people come here, <clears throat> their travel is paid, they are fully hosted, and we look for the honoraria that are at least symbolic rather than trivial. To give an idea, any given planning meeting basically costs between four and eight thousand dollars. And so that means that one has to find the funding. Part of this has come from various generous funds from the Graham Sustainability Institute, whose chop you saw earlier, because we're all looking for sustainable ways forward and how we feed ourselves is a key part and restoring seeds to the communities is part of that. Amongst the other elements here is that the guidance is that 
when we build this garden and it's in a very secured site, traditional tools are used because that's what the seeds last knew and that's how the earth should be prepared. At least that's how I as a non-native person interpret the instruction. So that's why the traditional tools, no steel, no, no iron, the mounds, whether we do it in mounds or rows, it changes every, every year depending upon the community that is guiding that year. What you see here is that currently we are not growing seeds from the museum. It was thought that what we should first do is one, show that we can work together for a number of years so that anyone who is concerned about our capacity to engage before quote, risking the seeds with the community, um, that we could put that to the side. And that meant working with people within the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network within the tribes and looking at what was of interest to the tribes. Everything grown here is returned to the community of origin or the, or the family that presented them. And throughout this process of working and growing together, um, so much has emerged. So much, uh, not only uh, agricultural and econo ecological knowledge, but spiritual and cultural knowledge has emerged. And it's emerged in ways of reactivation and memory of um, the work and working in the earth, working with each other, taking care of these beautiful spirits, these seeds, uh, and growing them to uh, become a vegetable or a food source for us has, has triggered our own blood memories for many of us. And one of, I just want to share a, a, an experience uh, through this collaborative garden in that it has reactivated our cultural ways and protocols of exchanging seeds and what that entails. Uh, I think any one of us who has gone to a seed exchange, there are tables set up and you can take a packet of seeds and walk away from the table. Uh, for indigenous people, there, it's a ceremony and it's, it's, a, it's a binding of one, one person to another and, and committing to take care of the seed, take care of the spirit of those, those beings. And through this process, which you would, you know, find um, very profound in that this all is in a university setting, whenever we begin our planting and our harvesting and our feasting, uh, the Anishinaabe spiritual protocols always come first and are, are woven throughout the entire process. So we don't start moving the earth, handling the earth and placing these seeds in there without pipe, without tobacco, without water ceremony and without feeding mother earth first. Um, so the seed exchange uh, protocols between us when we share seeds with one another, that has been reactivated. Other reactivation has been planting songs and prayers are coming back to us. Uh, through this process. Um, so there are so many gifts, not just the, 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 the fruit, the crop that we, we bring forth, but the gifts leading up to that and the understanding of how important it is to take care of our food, take care of our seeds, because they, they will take care of us has emerged through this process. The actual garden is fairly small. You see about a third of it, a quarter of it, through the greenhouse window behind Shiloh Maples here of Indigenous Seed Keepers Network um, in 2020 when the harvest was in, during COVID. Yes, this entire engagement continued right through COVID with the coordinated very carefully with the Central University management that we were following strict COVID protocols, because of course, no one wants to bring any illness home to the elders. And we don't wish to be a plague vector. There's been enough of that in colonial history. And I've intentionally not said 
any great detail or given aerial photos or pictures of the garden. It is located within a research complex between research greenhouses that themselves are joined by buildings. So the courtyards are long and narrow and no deer or raccoons can get in, which turns out to be very important given the number of deer and raccoons on around the property outside. <clears throat> These greenhouses are also not open to the public. So this gives us a level of security because one of the great concerns is that there may be people <clears throat> who want to steal the corns or the melons or the sunflowers or the amaranths or anything else that's grown out there and either patent genomes or just have the seeds themselves as hoarders or to put them out in some way. And I also have to say that there are those amongst the Euro-American community who have very strange ideas about what it is to be an ally and a liberator of where what they're really doing is marauding. So for physical security, it's in a place where we can control it. For genomic security, and Dan Cornelius, of, then of intertribal agriculture, he was in a previous image, emphasized to us that we need to be really careful that there is no concurrently blooming corn on site or within any area that we control, or if there is, that we need to be aware so we can do controlled pollinations ourselves. We don't need GMO seeds. We don't need the issues coming out of a Supreme Court decision of involving that. These are traditional seeds, and as we work on the ones out of the museums, it's essential that they be the seeds the communities placed with the university and that we can return, rematriate as the kin that had left here. For our own security, and it's also part of um, an effort to be parallel to the NAGPRA issues is that the courtyards are locked separately from the rest of the building. Yes, you could break the glass to get in, but at least we'd know. Our concern here is how little tissue it takes to actually get a genome out of a plant and that we don't want being in an international research community for someone to just try to surreptitiously take a little bit and end up having the genomes and trying to patent them somewhere else. So these are all concerns, <clears throat> which is also why it's not in the public and at present why there's so little public um, presence about it. When there is public presence, it will be led by our tribal partners. It will be hosted by us, but not led by us. Is it my turn? <laughs> All right. Um, so again, my name is Rose Bud Schneider. Um, I'm currently the um, vice chair of Zebra Mijuang Board of Directors. Um, formerly a farmer and um, the market manager. Um, we were given this opportunity, uh, was it two years ago now that we've done that? Um, and that's la last year is actually uh, my first year um, participating in the, um, in the project. Um, and it was a real honor to be able to, um, you know, I've been I've been watching it from the sidelines, learning alongside many folks. Um, I've been in, you know, in this movement for, for I don't know, for a while now. Um, and it's a for me, it's an honor to be able to connect with these seed relatives, um, and you know, be able to grow them out and learn from them, and then share them with our community. Um, so, so this is a picture on the right was last year at our opening ceremony when we planted our corn sister. Um, and so we, you know, we getting to know the three sisters and, you know, my experience with them is that they're not all, not all are created equal <laughs> um, and understanding which, which grows best with each other. So last year we chose, um, if you see on the slide on the bottom uh, year 22, um, we chose the Bear Island Flint corn, which is a, um, a white flower um, accompanied with the Gateo squash 
and Chippewa beans and Odawa pole beans. And you can see the previous years what we're done. But I've had a lot of success with these three sisters. And there's been a really great, a big effort to, um, to uh, multiply our stock specifically with these Odawa pole beans. Um, we were given those um, some years ago. And actually when I started working in my work in Detroit, um, we were given Odawa pole beans back then and get to opossum and squash. So I've been growing those for, for a while now. Um, was there anything you wanted to say about this, David? Sure. <clears throat> so one of the corns as an example is this mm -hmm. particular corn by Jacques Desjardins, mm -hmm. which has been with his family for generations. He's in the red shirt on the left. This is at the harvest. Shannon had mentioned the protocols of gifting. The entire garden generated or gifted four braids of corn. And although they were grown here, we, the university, as with all the rest, have absolutely no say, nor should we, in where they go. And Jacques did the gifting. And mm -hmm. so they're presented in the middle as kind of a mandala. And then on the right, one braid was given to the then representative from Little Traverse Bay Band, which is Ziba Michoang Farms community. And on the right, I believe, is the subsequent year of it being grown out. And I don't know if you have more you want to say there about Rosebud, but this is, to my understanding, really what Jack wanted. And right. notice Jack is here for the gifting. Part of the honoring is we found the funds. It was essential for him to come down here to be present for the gifting. Who else can gift? So that's just part of the budget. Right. And you are right. We were um, we were gifted uh, a whole braid of that variety. That is the red, the um, red lake flint corn or but yeah, red lake flint corn. Um, and yeah, that was the first year that I was with Ziba Mijuang um, back in 2019, I believe. Um, so that picture on the right was our first, was our harvest from that first year. We were given that. And as we leave this, the corn, the mandamin here, I believe was about half of all of that that existed, according to Jack. Mm -hmm. it, it had gone down to very few in his mm -hmm. uh, in his uh, stewardship. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the partnership with uh, Little Traverse Bay Band and Zibo Mijuang um, is, you know, really meant to provide food sovereignty within the, um, within within the tribe, um, improve health of the tribal citizens um, by providing health, healthful food and engaging in active um, participation in growing and gathering food. It's one of our missions at Ziba Mijuang, um, along with providing education and um, education opportunities and subsistence opportunities for all tribal citizens. Oh, it skipped to one. Skip, all right. Uh, I think this was you, Shannon. So we talked about the gifts that we've received uh, in doing this, this beautiful uh, earthwork. Uh, but five key points that emerged and, and carry us through, uh, whether it's a planning meeting or, or harvesting or growing, um, is that we keep our long-term goals central. And long-term goal in working with the University of Michigan to free some of our seed relatives from the ethnobotanic collections, uh, testing the viability, growing them out, and getting these seeds back to their origin communities so that they can uh, grow them on their own land from where they, they came from. Uh, find and redirect internal funds to pilot work uh, that the elders, tribal elders, guide this work through and through, uh, in which they request. Uh, and again, we do everything with elder and culture keeper guidance. Uh, we always have our tobacco and offer our prayers, uh, vocalize our intentions to one another. And then listening to our museum garden peers for obstacles and stumbling blocks. You know, the, the experts that are working within 
you know, the institutional fields um, and doing heart listening with them, heart talk with them uh, so that we can work together to create this framework that we hope we could be replicated throughout the country. And, and we see that it has begun in some pockets throughout um, the United States where seed relatives are being returned. Um, and it's because of that coming together in a circle and, and talking with one another uh, and the understanding that for our own health and well-being, many of us need to have these sacred food medicines back in our community and we need to work with them, grow them and, and eat them throughout the year. Uh, I know that the Field Museum has returned seeds. So uh, this movement is, is, is taking hold. And then as always, uh, and what is led by um, the beautiful heart of David Michener is being a respectful host. Uh, David is is one that um, if we could replicate him uh, and put him, drop him into every university and institution that houses uh, indigenous seeds, uh, that would be a, a wonderful thing because he makes things happen and you have to have uh, and, and cultivate those types of, of relationships and allies and people within museums and institutions. And as indigenous people, we know what that means. Uh, to find a, a very good ally. And, um, you know, being the respectful host, um, he, he makes sure that um, when we arrive at our meeting spot, that there are tobacco ties, that there are fresh strawberries. Um, and, and that is just something that the University of Michigan uh, at Matai and also through our NACPRA work with uh, Ben Secunda and Amadea Scott, they provide um, these settings for Indigenous people when they arrive to make sure that we feel comfortable. Um, and traveling out to our communities, to attending our maple sugar tapping, to, you know, travel and, and do some farm work uh, at some of our Indigenous farms. Um, this, this is what the reciprocity and the relationship um, means. And, it, and it's growing. It's growing together and listening to one another. Miigwech, Shannon, but the idea of multiple of me, we'd all go into chaos as we argue with ourselves. It's bad enough just having it in my mind. <laughs> Miigwech. Just to tie up with a couple of things from what I will call the majority culture conundrums where we get in our own way. <clears throat> For rematriation, which is the return of seeds to the community, or in this case with the Indigenous Collaborative Garden, to grow the seeds here to be returned, either it's whichever way the community wants, is we have to have protocols. One of the key ones we don't understand yet, and two I'd seen we hope will, will lead with this, is how to wake up seeds that have been dormant so long. Modern American corns are bred to have a very short life because you can make money selling them. The traditional men's corns, as I understand it, were often kept five to seven years before they were planted out because it was always necessary to have food reserves. And some people find this in just unbelievable, but all you have to do is look at any of the narratives out of the British or American army of how many days, days it took to burn the corns of the indigenous peoples in the wars they had with the communities. The corns were bred to be stored and to waken up, but we don't really understand yet how to wake up the old ones. There has to be a way and a process for this museum, this unit complex, there are 18 museums here at the university, for our complex of museums and gardens to reach beyond this part of Turtle Island. Right now, we only have the protocol, the agreement with MACPRA for the 12 federally recognized tribes of Michigan. These are different climates. We're in a period of climate instability. What's the way forward? And a key one is how do we change professional ethics of museums and gardens so that 
the protocols here are normalized. But the whole idea of co-management of elder guidance are worked into our policies and our procedures rather than being viewed as a special project to the side. They aren't, they're foundational. There are over 4,000 seed lots in this university. That is, that's how they're accessioned. How do all the different peoples, indigenous peoples and tribes of North America, even discover what's here, find out what's here. What about the about 18 other seed collections we've been able to deduce are likely at other public and private universities and museums? How is this information carried out? And part of the reason for the protocols is you just can't have somebody coming up and saying, I'm from such and such nation, give me all the seeds. This is, has to be through the sovereign agency of the tribe, which is why we have the agreement and the sovereign nation, the tribes here in Michigan through MACRA designate who signs and whose hands the seeds will go to. And what information is appropriate to put out there? You'll notice we've done this, we've been engaged since 2016. You won't find much of this on the web. That's intentional. It's not because we don't know how to publicize on the tribal side or on the university side. It's because we have to rely on elder guidance and culture keeper guidance of what information is appropriate to share in a venue like this and how it might go beyond. And how do we speak to the broader publics, to the other tribes? Um, and that's part of why we're here today. So just here for this partner, this, these are the symbols or the indicia, so to speak, of various parts of the, this university and other institutions that have been involved. Some of the tribes and tribal agencies that involve, MACRA itself does not have a logo that um, loads well on here. Um, this takes a lot of doing. And what I hear in a number of other university and non-university museums, well, that's not my job. Friends, none of this is my job. It is all of our jobs and it is not a job. It is an ethical obligation and it is something that you have to discuss with your management of how we move forward as ethical, decent humans, stewarding parts of another culture's kin relationships in ways that will move forward for healing. So that's what I have to say. And Shannon and Rosebud, likely you have things to say too before we move to Q&A. Rosebud. It's gonna let you go. <laughs> um, no, I think this really covers it. I mean, again, like I can't express enough um, how much this this work, especially for individually and for our community, is is healing work. Um, I've been able to sit in many conversations with Shannon and Pumpkin and and um, folks doing this work, um, and I've been inspired. Um, that's, that's why I'm, that's why I, I do, I'm doing what I'm, what I'm doing now. Um, so the UC rel relatives have really given me purpose and helped me understand, um, what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> um, so I'm super grateful and I'm super grateful for, um, David, um, and all of the amazing work that he's doing and being, um, you know, a steward and an ally and our champion and, um, yeah, so I want to say miigwech. Um, that's it. That's, that's what I got. <laughs> and and we truly hope this inspires each and every one of you. If you don't have a, a raised bar garden bed, if you live in a city, you can get a box garden. You know, grow some grow some of your own seasonings, some basil, some sage. Um, but you know, these types of movements, you know, th they take root in your spirit. And they they awaken something within you that have been dormant. And when you know David has sp spoken about the the seed dormancy, there's a dormancy within us. And when we do this good work together, so much is awakened, so much blood memory 
uh, comes back to us. And um, encourage each and every one of you to work in the dirt, you know, grow some seeds out. Um, your food will never taste um, more beautiful than if you grow your own. And as we begin to see signs of spring, some, you know, some budding on the trees, we're, we're beginning to hear the, the, the songs of the birds change. Um, these are all signals. And, and that's another aspect of this work. And what we're trying to reactivate uh, is our songs, the signals we see in the spring. Um, when you hear the flicker and the pileated woodpecker tapping harder than they do during the, during the middle of winter, um, that means that's a signal for people to start getting uh, their, their maple sugar supplies ready. Start getting your buckets clean. Start you know, inventorying what you have because they're letting us know the sap's going to be running soon. And so it's, it's, it's a way um, of opening up to be more in tune with creation that this, this beautiful work. Uh, and when so many people come together from different tribal regions and groups and work together, we, we share important knowledge or important, their blood memories awakened and they share something. Um, so it's just, you know, I, I saw a question in the chat about, um, you know, what other types of collaborations can take place, you know, and um, we do know that many tribes here in Michigan uh, are practicing their own food sovereignty. They're, they, they're cultivating their own gardens. Um, they have programs where they're... Um, exercising their treaty rights to fish and gather medicines. And, um, you know, we're, we're doing this in cooperation as well with, you know, the Michigan Department of Natural Resources and, and working with them to find some of, some of these medicines and tree relatives that we need to, to do our good work here on the land. Um, so it's, you are not alone in this anymore. And it's, it's good to have partners and allies and, and never be afraid to ask for what you need. And many tribes are doing that. We're expanding our, our territories, our hunting and gathering. Um, and we're also activating protocols with one another, you know, especially with wild ricing. Uh, when there are tribes who have no access to harvest wild rice, they're uh, utilizing uh, ancestral pro protocols and gift giving and a petition to another tribe who has wild rice and their their delegation is meeting with the tribal leadership to request access to their wild rice lakes or streams rivers so there's a lot going on right here in the great lakes and i'm i'm so um hopeful that it's just going to continue growing with us getting back to our uh, ancestral diet, one that um, um, supports our genetics. And in that, we'll find good health. Um, when we cut back on, you know, the carbohydrates and the sugars, only only ingesting maple sugar uh, rather than, you know, the, the white, white granulated sugar. Those are things that our, our tribal uh, dietitians, our health departments, our cultural cultural programs and our environmental programs are now working together to do as much as they can to provide um, these these indigenous foods to our communities. And even if it's just a start, you know, one harvest in the fall and providing, um, you know, the the harvest maple sugar and some wild rice and um, squash. Uh, those boxes are getting to our communities, to our families that need it. And um, the return to our ancestral diet is slowly making its way back. And I'm happy to see that. Oh, I wanted to address one more question before turning this over to David. Somebody else in chat asked about the floral beadwork design along the side of our slides. Floral um, designed beadwork and quill work uh, is, is an identifier of many Great Lakes uh, tribal nations, from the Menominee to the, to the 
uh, Meskwaki, Jibwe, Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, uh, Cree, those types of, of floral designs uh, signify important uh, pharmacopoeia knowledge for family lines. So there was a time uh, when these designs would be worn by a particular family. And you could look at their bandolier bag uh, or their regalia and look at what they have. And with that, there'd be an understanding that they know uh, what the medicinal properties are of the, of the dogwood flower or the blood root. So they know how to work with that. And they carry the spirit of that plant medicine uh, or food on their bandolier bag. So these types of floral designs identified a person or a family and their knowledge of that particular plant medicine, food, or, or series of medicines. They would design that into their regalia, onto their bandolier medicine bag. Uh, so if you wanna know more information, there is a book um, about bandolier bags published by um, the Minnesota Historical Society called a bandolier bag is worth a pony, I think. So thank you for those questions. I, I hope I, I answered them as best that I could. Thank you all so much. I am uh, struggling to turn my, my camera back on for some reason, um, but uh, we really, you all took care of the question and answer better than I could have facilitated. So thank you so much to all of our presenters for that and fabulous questions from the audience. I do wanna draw everyone's attention to the slide that's up right now. You can see contact information for these amazing presenters. Um, if you have, I know we, we don't have time to go into detailed answers on to all of the fabulous questions you're asking. So please feel, feel free to reach out um, and follow up with us. But I'd like to say again, thank you to our presenters and thank you to the audience who attended. That concludes our program today.